Section 27 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James O'Connor. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 27. A Cat Clock. The following curious incident is to be found in Huck's Chinese Empire. One day when we went to pay a visit to some families of Chinese Christian peasants, we met near a farm a young lad who was taking a buffalo to graze along our path. We asked him carelessly as we passed whether it was yet noon. The child raised his head to look at the sun, but it was hidden behind thick clouds and he could read no answer there. The sky is so cloudy, said he, but wait a moment. And with these words he ran towards the farm and came back a few minutes afterwards with a cat in his arms. Look here, said he, it is not noon yet, and he showed us the cat's eyes by pushing up the lids with his hands. We looked at the child with surprise, but he was evidently in earnest and the cat, though astonished and not much pleased at the experiment made on her eyes, behaved with most exemplary compliance. Very well, said we, thank you, and he then let go the cat, who made her escape pretty quickly, and we continued our route. To say the truth, we had not at all understood the proceeding, but did not wish to question the little pagan, lest he should find out that we were Europeans by our ignorance. As soon as we reached the farm, however, we made haste to ask our Christians whether they could tell the clock by looking into the cat's eyes. They seemed surprised at the question, but as there was no danger in confessing to them our ignorance of the properties of the cat's eyes, we related what had just taken place. That was all that was necessary. Our complacent neophytes immediately gave chase to all the cats in the neighborhood. They brought us three or four, and explained in what manner they might be made use of for watches. They pointed out that the pupils of their eyes went on constantly growing narrower until twelve o'clock, when they became like a fine line, as thin as a hair, drawn perpendicularly across the eye, and that after twelve the dilation recommenced. Archbishop Waitley once declared that there was only one noun in English which had a real vocative case. It was cat, vocative puss. I wonder if this derivation is true. I take it from a New York journal. When the Egyptians of old worshipped the cat, they settled it that she was like the moon, because she was more bright at night, and because her eyes changed just as the moon changes from new to crescent and to full. So they made an idol of the cat's head and named it Pasht, which meant the face of the moon. Pasht became Pas, Pus, Pus. Church Times, March 8, 1888. Puss in Boots, Le Chat Bot, is from the eleventh night of Straparola's Italian fairy tales, where Constantine's cat procures his master a fine castle and the king's heiress. First translated into French in 1585, our version is taken from that of Charles Perrault. There is a similar one in the Scandinavian nursery tales. This clever cat secures a fortune and a royal partner for his master who passes off as the Marquis of Carabas, but is in reality a young miller without a penny in the world. The above is from Dr. Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable, and goes far to prove the antiquity of what is generally believed to be a modern story, many believing it to be one of the numberless pleasant, amusing, and in a sense instructive nursery or children's stories of the present time signs. Durfe, in his poem on Knoll, speaks of the cats at Seven Oaks. 
the cat or cats is by no means a common sign the subject is well alluded to in the cat past and present from the french of monsieur champfleury translated by mrs cachel hoey at page thirty three a sign is pictured from the lombards quarter paris it is there over a confectioner's shop and is a cat seated or rather two a sign being placed on either side of the corner underneath one is o chat the other noir i may add the work is a most excellent and amusing collection of much appertaining to cats and is well worthy of a place in the cat lover's library in larwood and houghton's history of signboards a work of much research and merit occurs the following as i was going through a street of london where i had never been till then i felt a general damp and faintness all over me which i could not tell how to account for till i chanced to cast my eyes upwards and found i was passing under a signpost on which the picture of a cat was hung this little incident of the cat hater told in number five hundred and thirty eight of the spectator is a proof of the presence of cats on the signboard where indeed they are still to be met with but very rarely there is a sign of the cat at egremont in cumberland a black cat at st leonard's gate lancaster and a red cat at birkenhead and a red cat in the hague holland to which is attached an amusing story worthy of perusal the cat and parrot and the cat and lion apparently have no direct meaning unless by the former may be inferred that if you lap like a cat of the liquid sold at the hostelry you will talk like a parrot yet according to larwood and houghton it was a bookseller's sign the cat in cage and the cat in basket were signs much in vogue during the frost fair on the thames in seventeen thirty nine to forty the live cat being hung outside some of the booths which afterwards was not infrequent at other festive meetings what the exact origin was is not quite apparent cat and fiddle a public-house sign is a corruption either of the french catherine la fidele wife of tsar peter the great of russia or of caton le fidele meaning caton governor of calais dr brewer's dictionary of phrase and fable cat and fiddle while on the subject of signboards says a writer in cassell's old and new london volume one page five hundred and seven we may state that piccadilly was the place in which the cat and fiddle first appeared as a public-house sign the story is that a frenchwoman a small shopkeeper at the eastern inn soon after it was built had a very faithful and favorite cat and that in the lack of any other sign she put over her door the words voici un chat fidele from some cause or other the chat fidele soon became a popular sign in france and was speedily anglicized into the cat and fiddle because the words form part of one of our most popular nursery rhymes we do not pledge ourselves as to the accuracy of this definition in farringdon devon is the sign of le chat fidele in commemoration of a faithful cat without scanning the phrase too nicely it may simply indicate that the game of cat trap ball and a fiddle for dancing are provided for customers yet according to larwood and houghton's history of signboards there is yet another version and another of the matter for it is stated a little hidden meaning is there in the cat and fiddle still a great favorite in hampshire the only connection between the animal and the instrument being that the strings are made from cats entrails parenthesis sick close parenthesis and that a small fiddle is called a kit and a small cat a kitten besides they have been united from time immemorial in the nursery rhyme hey diddle diddle the cat and the fiddle amongst the other explanations offered is the one that it may have originated with the sign of a certain caton fidele a staunch protestant in the reign of queen mary 
and only have been changed into the cat and fiddle by corruption but if so it must have lost its original appellation very soon for as early as fifteen eighty nine we find henry carr sign of the cat and fiddle in the old charge formerly there was a cat and fiddle at norwich the cat being represented playing on a fiddle and a number of mice dancing round her cat and bagpipes was not uncommon in ireland this instrument being the national one in place of the fiddle when doctors disagree who shall decide thus i leave it cat and mutton from cassell's old and new london volume four page two hundred and twenty three near the imperial gas works hagerstown is goldsmith's row this was formerly known as mutton lane a name still given to that part of the thoroughfare bordering on the southern extremity of london fields where stands a noted public house rejoicing in the sign of the cat and mutton affixed to the house and two signboards which are rather curious they have upon them the following doggerel lines pray puss do not tear because the mutton is so rare pray puss do not claw because the mutton is so raw cat and wheel most likely to be a corruption of catherine wheel there was a sign of this name in the borough southwark in france some signs are still more peculiar as a cat playing at racket chat qui pelote fishing cat le chat qui pêche the dancing cat and the well-known puss in boots whittington and his cat is by no means uncommon and was not unknown in the early part of the seventeenth century somewhere i remember having seen whittington's cat without the master which i suppose arose from the painter not knowing how to portray sir richard cat and kittens a public house sign alluding to the pewter pot so called stealing these pots is termed cat and kitten sneaking we still call a large kettle a kitchen and speak of a soldier's kit parentheses saxon sitel a pot pan or vessel generally close parentheses brewer's dictionary of phrase and fable may not this sign be intended to mean merely what is shown the cat and kittens indicative of comfort and rest or may it have been cat and chitterlings an allusion to the source from which fiddle-strings were said to be derived cat and tortoise this seems to have no meaning other than at a tavern extremes meet the fast and the slow the lively and the stolid or it is possibly a corruption of something widely different End of section 27 Recording by James O'Connor Randolph, Massachusetts March 2011Section 28 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Ware. Section 28. The Law on Cat Killing. An articled clerk writing to the Standard with regard to the illegality of killing cats states, it is clearly laid down in addison on torts that a person is not justified in killing his neighbor's cat or dog which he finds on his land unless the animal is in the act of doing some injurious act which can only be prevented by its slaughter and it has been decided by the case of townsend v watkin nine last two hundred and seventy seven that if a person sets on his land a trap for foxes and baits it with such strong smelling meat as to attract his neighbor's dog or cat onto his land to the trap and such animals thereby killed or injured he is liable for the act though he had no intention of doing it and though the animal ought not to have been on his land dead cats lifeless cats have been from time immemorial suggestive of foolish hoaxing a parcel being made up or a basket with the legs of a hare projecting directed to some one at a distance and on which the charge for carriage comes to a considerable sum the fortunate recipient ultimately to his great annoyance finding his present was nothing else but a dead cat dead cats which not infrequently were cast into the streets or accidentally killed there 
were sometimes used as objects of sport by the silly, low-minded, and vulgar, and it was thought a clever thing if they could deposit such in a drawing-room through an open window, or pitch the unfortunate animal, often crushed and dirty, into a passing carriage. But the time of times when it was considered to be a legitimate object to use was that of either a borough or county election, cats and rotten eggs forming the material with which the assault was conducted in the event of an unpopular candidate for honours attempting to give his political views to a deprecatory mob surrounding the hustings. An anecdote is recorded in Gross's Olio of Mr. Fox, who in 1784 was a candidate for Westminster, which goes far to show what dirty, degrading, disgusting indignities the would-be people's representative had to endure at that period, and with what good humour such favours of popular appreciation or otherwise were received. During the poll a dead cat being thrown on the hustings, one of Sir Cecil Ray's party observed it stunk worse than a fox, to which Mr. Fox replied, there was nothing extraordinary in that, considering it was a pole-cat. This is by no means the only ready and witty answer that has been attributed to Mr. Fox, though not bearing on the present subject. THE CAT AS A TORMENTOR Shakespeare, in Lucretia, says, Yet foul night-waking cat, he doth but dally, while in his holdfast foot the weak mouse panteth. In an essay on the art of ingeniously tormenting, 1753, the cat is alluded to in the frontispiece, a cat at play with a mouse, below which is the couplet, The cat doth play, and after slay. Child's Guide Giovanni Battista Casti, in his book Tre Giuli, 1762, likens the cat to one who lends money and suddenly pounces on the debtor. Thus sometimes with a mouse and nip the cat will on her hapless victim smile, until at length she gives the fatal grip. Again John Phillips, in the latter part of the seventeenth century, in his poem of The Splendid Shilling, referring to debtors, writes, Grimalkin, to domestic vermin sworn in everlasting foe, with watchful eye lies nightly brooding o'er a chinky gap, pretending her fell claws to thoughtless mice sure ruin. Heraldry, etc. A cat, hieroglyphically, represents false friendship or a deceitful flattering friend. The cat in heraldry is an emblem of liberty because it naturally dislikes to be shut up, and therefore the Burgundians, etc., bore a cat on their banners to intimate that they could not endure servitude. It is a bold and daring creature, and also cruel to its enemy, and never gives over till it has destroyed it, if possible. It is also watchful, dexterous, swift, pliable, and has good nerves. Thus, if it falls from a place never so high, it still alights on its feet, and therefore may denote those who have much forethought, that whatsoever befalls them, they are still on their guard. In coat armor they must always be represented as full-faced, and not showing one side of it, but both their eyes and both their ears. Argent, three cats in pale, sable is the coat of the family of Keat of Devonshire. Many families have adopted the cat as their emblem, and cats past and present, several are noted. In Scotland, the clan Chatton bore as their chief cognizance the wild cat, and called their chief Moor en Chat, the great wild cat. Nor is the name uncommon as an English surname, frequently appearing as C A T cat, C A T T cat, C A T T E cat. But the most strange association of the name with the calling was one I knew in my old sporting days of a gamekeeper whose name was Cat. End of section 28section 29 of our cats and all about them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jadopi our cats and all about them by harrison weir section 29 performing cats Cats, unlike dogs, are not amused by, nor do they in any way take an interest in, what are termed tricks. Performing dogs will sit about their master watching anxiously for their turn, and they have been known on more than one occasion 
to slip before the dog that has next jumped through the hoop or over a stick barking merrily, exulting in having excelled the other. Generally they await with intense eagerness the agility of the others and strenuously try to surpass them. Possibly this is so from the long time the dog has been under the dominion of man, and taught by him how to be of service, either in hunting, sporting, shepherding, watching, in a sense, his friend, though more his bond or slave, even to dragging carts, wagons and sleighs, to fetch and carry, even to smuggle. Long teaching, persistent teaching from time immemorial, has undoubtedly had its due effect, and in some instances, if not all, has been transmitted, such as in the pointer and setter, which particular sections have been known to require little or no present training, taking to their duties naturally, receiving but little guidance as to how much, when and where such instinctive qualities are required. With the cat, it is widely different. Beyond being the necessary cat, the pet cat or kitten, it never has been an object of interest, beyond that of keeping from increase those veritable plagues, rats and mice. The enormous use it has thus been to man has had but scant acknowledgment, never thoroughly appreciated, vastly underrated, but with little attention not only to its beauty, nor in modifying its nature to the actual requirements of civilization. The cat, through long ages, has had, as it were, to shift for itself, with the few approved, with the many not only neglected, but in bygone days, and within some, even in the present, it has been, and is looked on as a thing that is not to be cared for, or domesticated, but often absolutely ill-treated, not because there has been wrong done, but because it is a cat. I heard a man of gentle blood once say that there was no good in a cat, and the only use they were, as far as he could see, was as an animal to try the courage of his terriers upon. Happily, all are not alike, and so the cat survives, and by the present generation is petted and noticed with a growing interest. Though long closely connected with man in many ways, Still, as I have said before, it has been left to itself to a certain degree. In no way, or but slightly, has it been guided, and thus, as a domestic animal, it has become what it is, one repelling most attempts to make it of the same kind of value as the dog. Its great powers of observation, coupled with timidity, make a barrier to its being trained into that which its nature dislikes and its natural and acquired repugnance to confinement and tuition prevent it, at least at present, from being the humble servant, as the dog, past and present, has been and is. Studying closely the habits of the cat for years, as I have, I believe there is a natural sullen antipathy to being taught or restrained, or made to do anything to which its nature or feelings are averse and this arises from long-continued persecution and no training. Try, for instance, to make a cat lie still if it wants to go out. You may hold it at first, then gently relinquish your grasp, stroke it, talk to it, fondle it until it purrs, and purrs with seeming pleasure, but it never once forgets it is restrained, and the first opportunity it will make a sudden dash, and is gone. However, all animals, more or less, may be trained, and the cat, of course, is among them, and a notable one. By bringing them up among birds, such as canaries, pigeons, chickens, and ducklings, it will respect and not touch them, while those wild will be immediately sacrificed. One of the best instances of this was a small collection of animals and birds in a large cage that used to be shown by a man by the name of Austin and to which I have already referred. This man was a lover and trainer of animal life, and an adept. His happy family generally consisted of a cat or two, some kittens, rats, mice, rabbits, guinea pigs, an owl, a kestrel falcon, starlings, goldfinches, canaries, etc., a most incongruous assembly. Yet among them all there was a freedom of action, a self-reliance, and an air of happiness that I have never seen in performing cats. 
Mr. Austin informed me that he had been a number of years studying their different natures, but that he found the cats the most difficult to deal with, only the most gentle treatment accomplishing the object he had in view. Any fresh introduction had to be done by degrees, and shown outside first for some time. It was quite apparent, however, that the cats were quite at their ease, and I have seen a canary sitting on the head of the cat, while a starling was resting on the back. But all are gone, Austin and his pets, and no other reigns in his stead. Occasionally one sees at the corners of some of the London streets a man who professes to have trained cats and birds. The latter certainly are clever, but the former have a frightened, scared look, and seem by no means comfortable. I should say the tuition was on different lines to that of Austin. The man takes a canary, opens a cat's mouth, puts it in, takes it out, makes the cat or cats go up a short ladder and down another. Then they are told to fight, and placed in front of each other. But fight they will not with their forepaws, so the master moves their paws for them, each looking away from the other. There is no training in this but fear. There is an innate timidity, the offspring of long persecution in the cat that prevents, as a rule, is performing in public. Not so the dog. Time and place matter not to him. From generation to generation he has been used to it. In Cats Past and Present by Chamfleury there are descriptions of performing cats, and one, Valmont de Beaumere, mentions that in a booth at the fair of Saint-Germain, during the eighteenth century, there was a cat concert, the word miaulic in huge letters being on the outside. In 1789 there is an account of a Venetian giving cat concerts, and the facsimile of a print of the seventeenth century picturing a cat showman. In 1758, or the following year, Bisset, the famous animal trainer, hired a room near the haymarket, at which he announced a public performance of a cat's opera, supplemented by tricks of a horse, a dog, and some monkeys, etc. The cat's opera was attended by crowded houses, and Bisset cleared a thousand pounds in a few days. After a successful season in London, he sold some of the animals, and made a provincial tour with the rest, rapidly accumulating a considerable fortune. Mr. Frost's Old Showman Many years ago a concert was given at Paris, wherein cats were the performers. They were placed in rows, and a monkey beat time to them. According as he beat the time, so the cats mewed, and the historian of the fact relates that the diversity of the tones which they emitted produced a very ludicrous effect. This exhibition was announced to the Parisian public by the title of Concert Miaulant, Zoological Anecdotes. Another specimen of discipline is to be found in menageries. The writer says, Cats may be taught to perform tricks, such as leaping over a stick, but they always do such feats unwillingly. There is at present an exhibition of cats in Regent Street, who, at the bidding of their master, an Italian, turn a wheel and draw up water in a bucket, ring a bell, and in doing these things begin, continue, and stop as they are commanded. But the commencer, continuer, arrêter of their keeper is always enforced with a threatening eye, and often with a severe blow, and the poor creatures exhibit the greatest reluctance to proceed with their unnatural employments. They have a subdued and piteous look, but the scratches upon their master's arms show that his task is not always an easy one. Of performing cats on the stage, there have been several companies of late in London, one of which I went to see at the Royal Aquarium, Westminster, and I am bound to say that the relations between master and cats were on a better footing than any that have hitherto come under my notice. On each side of the stage there were cat kennels, from which the cats made their appearance on a given signal, ran across, on or over, whatever was placed between, and disappeared quickly into the opposite kennels. But about it all there was a decided air of timidity, and an eagerness to get the performance over and done with. When the cats came out they were caressed and encouraged, which seemed to have a soothing effect, 
and I have a strong apprehension that they received some dainty morsel when they reached their destination. One ran up a pole at command, over which there was a cap at the top, into which it disappeared for a few seconds, evidently for some reason, food, perhaps. It then descended, but before this supreme act several cats had crossed a bridge of chairs, stepping only on the backs, until they reached the opposite house or box into which to retire. The process was repeated, and the performance varied by two cats crossing the bridge together, one passing over, and the other under the horizontal rung between the seat and the top of the chair. A long plank was next produced, upon which was placed a row of wine bottles at intervals, and the cats ran along the plank, winding in and out between the bottles, first to the right, then to the left, without making a mistake. This part of the performance was varied by placing on the top of each bottle a flat disc of thick wood. One of the cats strode then from disc to disc, without displacing or upsetting a bottle, while the other animal repeated its serpentine walk on the plank below. The plank being removed, a number of trestles were brought in and placed at intervals in a row between the two sets of houses, when the cats, on being called, jumped from trestle to trestle, varying the feet by leaping through a hoop, which was held up by the trainer between the trestles. To this succeeded a performance on the tightrope, which was not the least curious part of the exhibition. A rope being stretched across the arena from house to house, the cats walked across in turn without making a mistake. Some white rats were then brought and placed at intervals along the rope, when the cats, recrossing from one end to the other, strode over the rats without injuring them. A repetition of this feat was rendered a little more difficult by substituting for rats, which sat pretty quietly in one place, several white mice and small birds, which were more restless, and kept changing their positions. The cats recrossed the rope and passed over all these obstacles without even noticing the impediments placed in their way. With one or two exceptions, when they stopped and cosseted one or more of the white rats, two of which rode triumphantly on the back of a large black cat. Perhaps the most odd performance was that of Cat Harris, an imitator of the voice of cats, in 1747. When Foote first opened the Haymarket Theatre, amongst other projects, he proposed to entertain the public with imitation of cat music. For this purpose, he engaged a man famous for his skill in mimicking the mewing of the cat. This person was called Cat Harris. As he did not attend the rehearsal of this odd concert, Foot desired Shooter would endeavor to find him out and bring him with him. Shooter was directed to some court in the minories where this extraordinary musician lived, but not being able to find the house, Shooter began a cat solo. Upon this, the other looked out of the window and answered him with a cantata of the same sort. Come along, said Shooter. I want no better information than you are the man. Foot stays for us. We cannot begin the cat opera without you. Castles Old and New London, Volume 4 Cat Racing in Belgium On festival days, parties of young men assemble in various places to shoot with crossbows and muskets, and prizes of considerable value are often distributed to the winners. Then there are pigeon clubs and canary clubs, for granting rewards to the trainers of the fleetest carrier pigeons and best warbling canaries. Of these clubs, many individuals of high rank are the honorary presidents, and even royal princes deign to present them banners without which no Belgian club can lay claim to any degree of importance. But the most curious thing is cat racing, which takes place, according to an engraving, in the public thoroughfare, the cats being turned loose at a given time. It is thus described. Cat racing is a sport which stands high in popular favor. In one of the suburbs of Liege, it is an affair of annual observance during carnival time. Numerous individuals of the feline tribe are collected, each having round his neck a collar with a seal attached to it, precisely like those of the carrier pigeons. The cats are tied up in sacks, and as soon as the clock strikes the solemn hour of midnight, 
the sacks are unfastened, the cats let loose, and the race begins. The winner is the cat which first reaches home, and the prize awarded to its owner is sometimes a ham, sometimes a silver spoon. On the occasion of the last competition, the prize was won by a blind cat. Pictorial Times, June 16, 1860 End of section 29. Recording by Jadopi. www.jadopi.wordpress.com Section 30 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jadopi. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 30. Cat Images. Those with long memories will not have forgotten the Italian with a board on his head, on which were tied a number of plaster casts, and possibly still seem to hear in the faraway time the unforgotten cry of Ya Images. Notably among these works of art were models of cats, such cats, such expressive faces, and what forms! How droll, too, were those with a moving head, wagging and nodding, as it were, with a grave and thoughtful, semi-reproachful, vacant gaze! Ya Images has passed on, and the country peddler with his crockery cats, mostly red and white. Sure such cats alive were never seen, but in burnt clay they existed, and often adorned the mantel-shelves of the poor. What must the live cat sitting before the fire have thought, if cats think, when it looked up at the stolid, staring, stiff and stark newcomer? One never sees these things now, nor the cats made of pasteboard covered with black velvet, and two large brass spangles for eyes. These were put into dark corners with an idea of deception, with the imbecile hope that visitors would take them to be real flesh-and-bone everyday black cats. But was anyone ever taken in but the maker? Then there were cats and cats and kittens made of silk, for selling at fancy fairs, not much like cats, but for the purposes good. Cats sitting on pen wipers, clay cats of burnt brick earth. These were generally something to remember rather than possess. Wax cats also, with a cotton wick coming out at the top of the head. It was a saddening sight to see these beauties burning slowly away. Was this a remnant of the burning of the live cats in the good old times? And cats made of rabbit skins were not uncommon, and far better to give children to play with than the tiny, lovable, patient live kitten, which, if it submit to be tortured, it is well, but if it resent pain and suffering, then it is beaten. There is more ill done from want of thought than want of heart. But kittens have fallen upon evil times. Ay, even in these days of education and enlightenment, as long as the world lasts, probably there will be the foolish, the gay, unthinking, and in tastes the ridiculous. But then there are, and there ever will be, those that are always craving, thirsting, longing, shall I say, mad, for something new. Light-headed, with softened intellects, who must, they say they must, have some excitement or some novelty, no matter what, to talk of or possess, though all that is ephemeral, and the silliness only lasts a few hours. Long or short, they are never conscious of these absurdities, and look forward with all the eagerness of doll-pleased infancy for another craze. The world is being denuded of some of its brightest ornaments and its heaven-taught music, in the slaughter of birds, to gratify for scarcely a few hours the insane vanity that is now rife in the ballroom. Fashion. What has all this to do with cats? Why, this class of people are not content, they never are so, but are adding to the evil by piling up a fresh one. It is the kitten now, the small, about two or three weeks old kitten, that is the fashion. Not long ago they were killed and stuffed for children to play with, better so than alive, perhaps, but now they are to please children of a larger growth, 
their tightly filled skins adorned with glass eyes being put in sportive attitudes about portrait frames and such like uses. It is comical, and were it not for the stupid, bad taste and absurdity of the thing, one would feel inclined to laugh at clambering kitten skins about, and supposed to be peeping into the face of a languor-struck beauty. Who buys such? Does anyone? If so, where do they go? Over thirty kittens in one shop window. What next? And next? Truly, frivolity is not dead. From these, and such as these, turn to the models fair and proper, the china, the porcelain, the terracotta, the bronze, and the silver, both English, French, German, and Japanese, some exquisite, with all the character, elegance, and grace of the living animals. In these there has been a great advance of late years, Miss A. Chaplin taking the lead. Then, in bold point tracery on pottery, Miss Barlow tells of the animal's flowing lines and non-angular posing. Art, true art, all of it, and art to be coveted by the lover of cats, or for art alone. But I have almost forgotten the old-time custom of, when the young ladies came from school, bringing home a sampler, in the days before linen stamping was known or thought of. On these, in needlework, were alphabets, numbers, trees, such trees, dogs and cats. Then, too, there were cats of silk and satin in needlework, and cats in various materials, but the most curious among the young people's accomplishments was the making of tortoiseshell cats from a snail shell, with a smaller one for a head, with either wax or bread ears, four legs and tail, and yellow or green beads for eyes. Droll-looking things, very. I give a drawing of one. And last, not least often, the edible cats, cats made of cheese, cats of sweet sponge cake, cats of sugar, and once I saw a cat of jelly. In the old times of country pleasure fairs, when everyone brought home gingerbread nuts and cakes as a fairing, the gingerbread cat in boots was not forgotten nor left unappreciated, generally fairly good in form and gilt over with Dutch metal. It occupied a place of honor in many a country cottage home, and, for the matter of that, also in the busy town. If good gingerbread, it was saved for many a day, or until the holiday time was ended and feasting over, and the next fair talked of. But after all said and done, what a little respect, regard, and reverence is there in our mode to that of the Egyptians! They had three varieties of cats, but they were all the same to them, as their pets, as useful, beautiful, and typical. They were individually and nationally regarded, their bodies embalmed, and verses chanted in their praise, and the image of the cat then, a thousand years ago, was a deity. What do they think of the cat now, these same though modern Egyptians? Scarcely anything. And we who in bygone days persecuted it, Today give it a growing recognition as an animal both useful, beautiful, and worthy of culture. End of section thirty. Recording by Jadopi. www.jadopi.wordpress.com Section thirty one of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 31. Lovers of Cats. The Turks greatly admire cats. To them, their alluring figure appears preferable to the docility, instinct, and fidelity of the dog. Mohammed was very partial to cats. It is related that being called up on some urgent business, he preferred cutting off the sleeve of his robe to waking the cat that lay upon it asleep. Nothing more was necessary to bring these animals into high request. A cat may even enter a mosque. It is caressed there as the favourite animal of the prophet, while the dog that should dare appear in the temple would pollute them with his presence, and would be punished with instant death. 
I am indebted to the Reverend T. G. Gardner of St. Paul's Cray for the following from the French. A recluse, in the time of Gregory the Great, had it revealed to him in a vision that in the world to come he should have equal share of beatitude with that pontiff. But this scarcely contented him, and he thought some compensation was his due, inasmuch as the Pope enjoyed immense wealth in this present life, and he himself had nothing he could call his own save one pet cat. But in another vision he was censured, his worldly detachment was not so entire as he imagined, and that Gregory would with far greater equanimity part with his vast treasure than he could part with his beloved puss. Cats endowed by La Belle Stuart one of the chief ornaments of the court of St. James in the reign of Charles the Second was La Belle Stuart, afterwards the Duchess of Richmond, to whom Pope alluded as the Duchess of R. in a well-known line, Die and endow a college or a cat. The endowment satirised by Pope has been favourably explained by Wharton. She left annuities to several female friends, with the burden of maintaining some of her cats a delicate way of providing for poor and probably proud gentlewomen without making them feel they owed their livelihood to her mere liberality but possibly there may have been a kindliness of thought for both deeming that those who were dear friends would be most likely to attend to her wishes mr samuel pepys had at least a gentle nature as regards animals if he was not a lover of cats for in his diary occurs this note as to the fire of london sixteen sixty six September 5th. Thence homeward, having passed through Cheapside and Newgate Market, all burned, and having seen Anthony Joyce's house on fire, and took up, which I keep by me, a piece of glass of Mercer's Chapel in the street, where much more was, so melted and buckled with the heat of the fire like parchment. I did also see a poor cat taken out of a hole in the chimney, joining the wall of the exchange, with the hair all burnt off its body, and yet alive. Dr. Jorton wrote a Latin epitaph on a favourite cat. Imitated in English. Worn out with age and dire disease, a cat, friendly to all, say wicked mouse and rat, I'm sent at last to ford the Stygian lake, and to the infernal coast a voyage make. Me proserpine received and smiling said, Be blessed with the knees mansions of the dead, Enjoy among thy velvet-footed loves, Elysian sunny banks and shady groves. But if I've well deserved, O gracious Queen, if patient under sufferings I have been, grant me at least one night to visit home again, once more to see my home and mistress dear, and purr these grateful accents in her ear. Thy faithful cat, thy poor departed slave, still loves her mistress, e'en beyond the grave. Dr. Barker kept a seraglio and colony of cats. It happened that at the coronation of George I, the chair of state fell to his share of the spoil, as prebendary of Westminster, which he sold to some foreigner. When they packed it up, one of his favourite cats was enclosed along with it. But the doctor pursued his treasure in a boat to Gravesend and recovered her safe. When the doctor was disgusted with the ministry, he gave his female cats the names of the chief ladies about the court and the male ones, those of the men in power, adorning them with the blue, red, and green insignia of ribbons, which persons they represented wore. Daniel, in his Rural Sports, 1813, mentions the fact that in one of the ships of the fleet that sailed lately from Falmouth for the West Indies, went as passengers a lady and her seven lapdogs, for the passage of each of which she paid thirty pounds on express condition that they were to dine at the cabin table and lap their wine afterwards. Yet these happy dogs do not engross the whole of their good lady's affection. She has also, in Jamaica, forty cats and a husband. The partiality to the domestic cat has been thus established. Some years since, a lady of the name of Greggs died at an advanced age in Southampton Row, London. Her fortune was £30,000 at the time of her decease. Credite postieri. Her executors found in her house 86 living and 28 dead cats. Her mode of interring them was, as they died, to place them in different boxes, which were heaped on one another in closets, as the dead are described by Pennant to be in the church of St. Giles. She had a black female servant, 
to her she left a hundred and fifty pounds per annum to keep the favourites whom she left alive the chantrell family of rottingdean seem also to be possessed with a similar kind of feeling towards cats exhibiting no fewer than twenty-one specimens at one cat show which at the time were said to represent only a small portion of their stock these ultimately became too numerous getting beyond control signor foley is a lover of cats and has exhibited at the crystal palace cat show petrarch loved his cat almost as much as he loved laura and when it died he had it embalmed tasso addressed one of his best sonnets to his female cat cardinal wolsey had his cat placed near him on a chair while acting in his judicial capacity sir i newton was also a lover of cats and there is a good story told of the philosopher having two holes made in the door for his cat and her kitten to enter by a large one for the cat and a small one for the kitten peg woffington came to london at twenty-two years of age after calling many times unsuccessfully at the house of john rich the manager of covent garden she at last sent up her name she was admitted and found him lolling on a sofa surrounded by twenty-seven cats of all ages the following is from the echo respecting a lady well known in her profession miss ellen terry has a passionate fondness for cats she will frolic for hours with her feline pets never tiring of studying their graceful gambols an author friend of mine told me of once reading a play to her during the reading she posed on an immense tiger skin surrounded by a small army of cats at first the playful capers of the mistress and her pets were toned down to suit the quiet situations of the play but as the reading progressed and the plot approached a climax the antics of the group became so vigorous and drolly excited that my poor friend closed the manuscript in despair and abandoned himself to the unrestrained expression of his mirth declaring that if he could write a play to equal the fun of miss terry and her cats his fortune would be made cooper loved his pet hares spaniel and cat and wrote the well-known cat retired from business gray wrote a poem on a cat drowned in a vase which contained goldfish cardinal richelieu was a lover of the cat montaigne had a favorite cat among painters gottfried mind was not only fond of cats but was one of if not the best at portraying them in action and in england no one has surpassed caudery in delineation nor miss chaplin in perfection of modelling i am the fortunate possessor of several of her models in terracotta which though small are beautiful in finish of one miss chaplin informed me the details were scratched in with a pin for want of better and proper tools end of section thirty one Section 32 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Denny Sayers. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 32 Games Cats Cradle or catch cradle dr brewer in his dictionary of phrase and fable thinks this quote, the corrupt for cratch cradle or manger cradle in which the infant saviour was laid cratch is the french crèche a rack or manger and to the present hour the racks which stand in the fields for cattle to eat from are called cratches Close quote. Of this, however, I am doubtful, though there is much reason in his suggestion. In Sussex and Kent, when I was a boy, it was commonly played among children, but always called cats, catch or scratch cradle, and consisted generally of two or more players. A piece of string being tied at the ends was placed in the fingers and crossed and recrossed to make a sort of cradle. The next player inserted his or her fingers, quickly taking it off, then the first catching it back, then the second again, then the first as fast as possible, catching and taking off the string. Sometimes the sides were caught by the teeth of the players, 
one on each side, and as the hands were relaxed, the faces were apart. Then, when drawn out, it brought the faces together. The string, being let go or not, and caught again as it receded, was according to the will of the players, the catching and letting go affording much merriment. When four or five played, the string rapidly passed from hand to hand, until, in the rapidity of the motion, one missed, who then stood out, and so on, until only one was left, winning the game of cats, catch or scratch cradle. It was varied also to single and double cradle, according to the number of crossings of the string. Catch is easily converted into cats, or it might be so called from the catching or clawing at, to get and to hold the entanglement. Cat trap, bat and ball. With the form of the trap our readers are doubtless acquainted. It will only be necessary for us to give the laws of the game. Two boundaries are equally placed at some distance from the trap, between which it is necessary for the ball to pass when struck by the batsman. If it fall outside either of them, he loses his innings. Innings are drawn for, and the player who wins places the ball in the spoon of the trap, touches the trigger with the bat, and, as the ball ascends from the trap, strikes it as far as he can. One of the other players, who may be from two to half a dozen, endeavors to catch it. If he do so before it reaches the ground, or hops more than once, or if the striker miss the ball when he aims at it, or hits the trigger more than once without striking the ball, he loses his innings, and the next, in order, which must previously be agreed on, takes his place. Should the ball be fairly struck and not caught, as we have stated, the out player, into whose hand it comes, bowls it from the place where he picks it up, at the trap, which, if he hit, the striker is out. If he miss it, the striker counts one towards the game, which may be any number decided on. There is also a practice in some places, when the bowler has sent in the ball, of the striker's guessing the number of bats' lengths it is from the trap. If he guess within the real number, he reckons that number toward his game, and if he guess more than there really are, he loses his innings. It is not necessary to make the game in one innings. Puss in the Corner This is a very simple, but at the same time, a very lively and amusing game. It is played by five only, and the place chosen for the sport should be a square court or yard with four corners, or any place where there are four trees or posts, about equidistant from each other, and forming the four points of a square. Each of these points or corners is occupied by a player. The fifth, who is called Puss, stands in the center. The game now commences. The players exchange corners in all directions. It is the object of the one who stands out to occupy any of the corners which may remain vacant for an instant during the exchanges. When he succeeds in doing so, that player who is left without a corner becomes the puss. It is to be observed that if A and B attempt to exchange corners, and A gets to B's corner, but B fails to reach A's before the player who stands out gets there, it is B and not A who becomes the puss. Cat and Mouse This is a French sport. The toys with which it is played consist of two flat bits of hard wood, the edges of one of which are notched. The game is played by two only. They are both blindfolded and tied to the ends of a long string which is fastened in the center to a post by a loose knot, so as to play easily in the evolutions made by the players. The party who plays the mouse occasionally scrapes the toys together, and the other, who plays the cat, attracted by the sound, endeavors to catch him. Cat and Mouse Hunting The game of Hunt the Slipper, used frequently to be called, cat and mouse hunting. 
it is generally played with a slipper shoe or even a piece of wood which was called the mouse the center player being the cat and trying to catch or find the mouse the boy's own book thus describes the game but not as cat and mouse Quote, several young persons sit on the ground in a circle a slipper is given them and one who generally volunteers to accept the office in order to begin the game stands in the center and whose business it is to chase the slipper by its sound the parties who are seated pass it around so as to prevent if possible its being found in the possession of any individual in order that the player in the center may know where the slipper is it is occasionally tapped on the ground and then suddenly handed on to the right or left when the slipper is found in the possession of any one in the circle by the player who is hunting it the party on whom it is found takes the latter player's place Close quote. tip cat is a game played with sticks of a certain length and a piece of wood sharpened off at each end which is called the cat a ring is made on the ground with chalk or the pointed part of the cat which is then placed in the center one end being smartly struck by the player it springs spinning upwards as it rises it is again struck and thus knocked to a considerable distance it is played in two ways one being for the antagonist to guess how many sticks length it is off the ring which is measured and if right he goes in or he may elect to pitch the cat if possible into the ring which if he succeeds in doing he then has the pleasure of knocking the wood called the cat recklessly he knows not whither until it alights somewhere on something or some one cat i the hole the name of a game well known in fife and perhaps in other counties if seven boys are to play six holes are made at certain distances each of the six stands at a hole with a short stick in his hand the seventh stands at a certain distance holding a ball when he gives the word or makes the sign agreed upon all the six must change holes each running to his neighbor's hole and putting his stick in the hole which he has newly seized in making this change the boy who has the ball tries to put it into the empty hole if he succeeds in this the boy who had not his stick for the stick is the cat in the hole for which he had run is put out and must take the ball when the cat is in the hole it is against the laws of the game to put the ball into it nursery rhymes and stories these are as plentiful as blackberries and are far too numerous to be treated of here some are very old such as puss in boots whittington and his cat hey diddle diddle etc some have a political meaning others satirical others amusing funny or instructive while a few are unmeaning jangles dame trot and her wonderful cat the cat and the mouse and later the white cat the adventures of miss manetta catina are familiar to many of the present time of the older stories and rhymes there are enough to fill a book not of or about the cat in particular possibly but even that the old combined with those of modern date might be done and for such information and perusal the popular rhymes by j o halliwell will be found very interesting space preventing the subject being amplified here nor do they come within the scope and intention for which i have written respecting the cat End of section 32section thirty three of our cats and all about them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by james o'connor 
Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 33. Fishing Cats. Having just come across a communication made to the Kelso Mail in 1880 by a correspondent giving the signature of March Brown, bearing on the subject to which I have already alluded, fishing cats, I deem it worthy of notice, corroborating as it does the statement so often made and almost as often denied that cats are adept fishers not only for food but likewise for the sport and pleasure they so derive the writer says that for several years it has been my happy fortune to fish the lovely tweed for salmon and trout from tweed well to cold stream is a long stretch but i have fished it all and believe that though other rivers have their special advantages there is not one in britain which offers such varied and successful angling as the grand border stream many have been the boatmen who i have employed whilst fishing for salmon and all were fairly honest except in the matter of a little poaching some had the complaint more fiercely than others and some so bad as to be incurable one of the afflicted donald by name was an excellent boatman by day as to his nocturnal doings i deemed it best not to inquire except on those occasions when he needed a holiday to attend a summons with which the police had favored him now any one who has studied the proclivities of poachers knows that they have wonderful powers over all animals who depend upon them such as dogs cats ferrets tame badgers otters etc etc donald's special favorite was a lady cat which followed him in his frequent fishings and took deep interest in the sport near to his cottage on the river bank was a dam or weir over which the water trickled here and there a few inches deep in the evenings of spring and summer donald was generally to be found fishing upon this favorite stretch with artificial fly for trout and being an adept in the art he seldom fished in vain pretty puss always kept close behind him watching the trail of the mimic flies till a fish was hooked and then her eagerness and love of sport could not be controlled and so soon as the captive was in shoal water in sprang puss up to the shoulders and fixing her claws firmly in the fish brought it to the bank when with a caress from donald she again took her place behind him till another trout was on the line and the sport was repeated in this way did puss and her master pass the evenings each proud of the other's doings and happy in their companionship such was the affection of the cat for her master that she could not even bear to be separated from him by day donald had charge of a ferry across the river and no sooner did a bell at the opposite side of the stream give notice that a passenger was ready to voyage across than down scampered puss to the boat and leaping in she journeyed with her master to the further side and again returned gravely watching each stroke of the oar many a voyage did she thus daily make and I question with these luxurious boatings and the exciting fishing in the evenings if ever cat was more truly happy. The love of fishing once developed itself to the disturbance of my own sport. With careful prevision, my boatman had, in the floods of November and December, secured a plentiful supply of minnows to be held in readiness till wanted in my fishings for salmon in the ensuing february and march the minnows were placed in a well two or three feet deep and the cold spring water rendered them as tough as angler could desire all went well for the first few days of the salmon fishing the minnows were deemed admirable for the purpose and the supply ample for our needs but this good fortune was not to last one morning the boatman reported a serious diminution of stock in the well and on the following day things were still worse suspicion fell on more than one honest person and we determined to watch late and early till the real thief was discovered when the good wife and bairns were abed 
the boatman kept watch from the cottage window and by the aid of a bright moon the mystery was soon solved at the well side stood puss the favorite of the household with arched back and extended paw she took her prey when an unfortunate minnow approached the surface sharp was the dash made by puss arm and shoulder were boldly immersed and straightway the victim lay gasping on the bank fishing in this manner she soon captured half a dozen and was then driven away from that evening the well was always covered with a net which scared puss into enforced honesty by nature cats love dry warmth and sunshine whilst they hate water and cold who has not seen the misery of a cat when compelled to step into a shallow pool and how she examines her wet paw with anxiety holding it up as something to be pitied and yet the passion of destructiveness is so strong within them as to overcome even their aversion to water the following still more extraordinary circumstance of a cat fishing in the sea appeared in the plymouth journal june eighteen twenty eight there is now at the battery on the devil's point a cat which is an expert catcher of the finny tribe being in the constant habit of diving into the sea and bringing up the fish alive in her mouth and depositing them in the guard-room for the use of the soldiers she is now seven years old and has long been a useful caterer it is supposed that her pursuits of the water rats first taught her to venture into the water to which it is well known puss has a natural aversion she is as fond of the water as a newfoundland dog and takes her regular peregrinations along the rocks at its edge looking out for her prey ready to dive for them at a moment's notice e d cats and horses from time immemorial cats have been kept in stables and when this is the case there is generally a friendly feeling between one or other of the horses and the cat or cats such i have known with the heavy ponderous cart horse and his feline companion such was the case in my stable and so in many others cats are as a rule fond of horses and the feeling is generally reciprocated several of our race winners have had their favorites at home among others the well-known foxhall many famous horses have had their stable cats and the great amiable foxhall has adopted a couple of kittens if it would not be more correct to say that they have adopted him a pretty little white and a tabby own brothers live in foxhall's box and when hatcher his attendant has rubbed him over and put on his clothing he takes up the kittens from the corner of the box where they have been waiting and gently throws them on foxhall's back they are quite accustomed to the process and catching hold soon settle down and curl themselves up into little fluffy balls much to their own satisfaction and to the good horses likewise to judge from the way in which he turns and watches the operation in lawrence's history of the horse it is stated that the celebrated arabian stallion godolphin and a black cat were for many years the warmest friends when the horse died in seventeen fifty three the cat sat upon his carcass till it was put underground and then crawling slowly and reluctantly away was never seen again till her dead body was found in a hayloft stubbs painted the portraits of the arabian and the cat there was a hunter in the king's stables at windsor to which a cat was so attached that whenever he was in the stable the creature would never leave her usual seat on the horse's back and the horse was so well pleased with the attention that to accommodate his friend he slept as horses will sometimes do standing end of section thirty three recording by james o'connor randolph massachusetts march two thousand eleven section thirty four of our cats and all about them 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 34. Grammar's Cat and Ours by John Taboys Tregellas. John Taboys Tregellas, seventeen ninety two to eighteen sixty five, born at St. Agnes. The greatest master of the niceties of the Cornish dialect, in which he wrote largely both in prose and verse. The piece quoted from is included in a volume of miscellanies published by Mr. Netherton Truro, and happily indicates the marked difference between the modern dialect of Cornwall and that of Devon, illustrated in Girt Offenders and Zmal. The hero of Grammar's Cat was a miner named Jim Chegwidden. To wash his hands and save the flushing, outside the door Jim did his washing but soon returned in haste and fright. Mother, I'll oh, come and see the sight. Up on our house there's such a row. Millions of cats is up there now. Jim's mother stared, and well she might. She knew that Jim had not said right. Millions of cats, you said. No, weren't it so? Why, yes, said Jim, and I believe it too. Not millions, perhaps, but thousands must be there, and fiercer cats than they you'll never hear. They're spitting, yowling, and the fur is flying. Some of them's dead, I suppose, and some is dying. Such dismal groans I'm sure you never heard. Oh, mother, if you did, you'd be afeard. Not I, said Jinny. No, not I indeed. A hundred cats out there these never seed, said Jim. I don't know exactly to a cat. They must be large ones then to do like that. They make such dismal noises when they're fighting, such scrowling and such tearing and such biting. Count every cat says Jinny, round and round. Yes, rums and yours, the account be twenty found. We'll call em twenty, mother, f twill do. Shut all the cats, say I, let's have my stew. No, Jimmy, no, no stew to-night. Tell all the cats is counted right. Here goes, said Jim. Left Grammar's cat go first. Of all the thievish cats, he is the worst. You know Maldigri's cat, he's neither black nor blue, but howsomever, he's a cat, and that makes two. There's that there short tailed cat, and she's a he. Short tail or long now, mother, that makes three. There's that there greyish cat, what stole the flower. He's here, I suppose, and that you know makes four. Trevenant's black as there if he's alive. No, mother, don't he see why that makes five? That no tailed cat that once was Uncle Dick's, he's sure there to night, and that makes six. That tabby cat you go to Georgie Bevan, I know his yowl, he's there, and that makes seven. That sickly cat we had could eat no mates. She's up there too tonight, and she makes eight. That genteel cat you know with fur so fine, she's surely there, I suppose, and that makes nine. Tom Avery's cat is there, they call him Ben, a regular fighter he, and he makes ten. The old maid's cat, Miss Jinkinbroth from Devon, I suppose she's there. And that, you know, makes eleven. There's Grace Penrose's cat got chets. Tis only two. And they're too young to fight as yet, so they won't do. Is leaven's all that I can mind. Not more than leaven you won't find. So let me have my supper, mother, and let the cats eat one another. No, Jimmy, no, it shan't be so. 
no supper shalt thou have this night until the cats thee's counted right go take the lantern from the shelf and go and count the cats thyself see hungry jimmy with his light turned out to count the cats aright and he who heard hugh tonkin blamed did soon return and much ashamed confessed the number was but two and both were cats that well he knew jim scratched his head and then he said there's grammar's cat and ours out there and they two cats made all that rout there but ef two cats made such a row tis like a thousand anyhow lost how beautiful she was in her superb calmness so graceful so mild and yet so majestic ah i was a younger man then of course than i am now and possibly more impressionable but i thought her then the most perfect creature i had ever beheld and even now looking back through the gathering mists of time and the chilling frosts of advancing age and recalling what she was I endorse that earlier sentiment. She lives in my memory now, as she lived in my presence then, as the most perfect creature I ever beheld. I had gone the round of all the best boarding-houses in town, when, at last, I went to Mrs. Honeywold's, and there, in her small, unpretending establishment, I, General Leslie Orchester, having been subdued i trust to a proper and humble state of mind by my past experiences agreed to take up my abode and it was there i first met her hers was the early maturity of loveliness perfect in repose with mild thoughtful eyes intelligent and tender a trifle sad at times but lighting up with quick brilliancy as some new object met her view or some vivid thought darted its lightning flash through her brain for she was wonderfully quick of perception with an exquisite figure splendidly symmetrical yet swaying and supple as a young willow and with unstudied grace in every quick sinewy motion she spent little upon dress i was sure she was not wealthy but though there was little variety her dress was always exquisitely neat and in perfect good taste of some soft glossy fabric smooth as silk and lustrous as satin and of the softest shade of silver grey that colour so beautiful in itself and so becoming to beautiful wearers simply made but fitting with a nicety more like the work of nature than of art to every curve and outline of that full and stately figure and finished off round her white throat with something scarcely whiter she never wore ornaments of any kind no chain no brooch no ring or pin she had twins two beautiful little blue-eyed things wonderfully like herself little shy graceful creatures always together always playful she never spoke of her own affairs and affable as she was and gentle in manner there was something about her which repelled intrusion when after some weeks residence there i had gained the good will of my simple-minded but kindly little landlady i cautiously ventured to ask her to gratify my not i think unnatural curiosity but i found to my surprise she knew but little more than i did myself she came to me she said just at the edge of the evening one cold rainy night and i could not refuse to give her shelter at least for the night or till she could do better i did not think of her remaining but she is so pretty and gentle and innocent looking i could not turn her out of my house could i now i know i am silly in such ways but what could i do but is it possible i said 
that she has remained here ever since, and you know nothing more about her? No more than you do yourself, General, said Mrs. Honeywold. I do not even know where she lived before she came here. I cannot question her, and now indeed I have become so fond of her, I should not be willing to part with her, and I would not turn her and her little ones out of my house for the world. Further conversation elicited the fact that she was not a boarder, but that she and her little ones were the dependents upon Mrs. Honeywold's charity. One fine summer day I had made an appointment with a friend to drive out to his place in the suburbs and dine with him, returning in the evening. When I came down in the afternoon, dressed for my excursion, I went into the dining-room to tell Mrs. Honeywold she need not wait for me. As I came back through the parlour, she was there alone. She was sitting on the sofa. A book lay near her, but I do not think she had been reading. She was sitting perfectly still, as if lost in reverie, and her eyes looked heavy with sleep or thought. But as I passed out of the room I looked back. I saw she had risen to her feet, and standing with her graceful figure drawn up to its full height, she was looking after me with a look which I flattered myself was a look of interest. Ah, oh, how well I remember that look! The day had been a beautiful one, though sultry, but in the early evening we had a heavy thunder-shower, the violence of the summer rain delaying my return to town for an hour or two, and when the rain ceased the evening was still starless, cloudy and damp, and as I drove back to town I remember that the night air, although somewhat freshened by the rain, was warm and heavy with the scent of unseen flowers. It was late when I reached the quiet street where I had taken up my abode, and as I mounted the steps I involuntarily felt for my latch-key, but to my surprise I found the hall door not only unfastened, but a little way opened. "'Why, how is this, Mrs. Honeywold?' I said, as my landlady met me in the hall. "'Do you know that your street door was left open?' "'Yes,' she said quietly. I know it. But is it safe? I asked, as I turned to lock the door, and so late, too. I do not think there is any danger, she said. I was on the watch. I was in the hall myself, waiting. Not waiting for me, I hope, said I. That was surely unnecessary. No, not for you, she answered. I presume you can take care of yourself, but, she added in a low voice, she is out, and I was waiting to let her in. Out at this time of night? That seems strange. Where has she gone? I do not know. And how long has she been gone? I asked as I hung up my hat. I cannot tell just what time she went out, she said. I know she was in the garden with the little ones, and came in just before tea. After they had had their suppers and gone to bed, I saw her in the parlour alone, and when I came into the room again she was gone, and she has not returned, and I— Oh, then she went out before the rain, did she? Yes, sir, some time before the rain. Oh, then that explains it. She was probably caught out by the rain and took shelter somewhere, and has been persuaded to stay. There is nothing to be alarmed at. You had better not wait up another moment. But I don't like to shut her out, General. I should not sleep a wink. Nonsense, nonsense, I said. Go to bed, you silly woman. You will hear her when she comes, of course, and you can come down and let her in. And so saying, I retired to my own room. The next morning at breakfast I noticed that my landlady was looking pale and troubled, and I felt sure she had spent a sleepless night. "'Well, Mrs. Honeywold,' I said with assumed cheerfulness as she handed my coffee to me, "'how long did you have to sit up? What time did she come in?' "'She did not come in all night, General,' 
said my landlady in a troubled voice. She has not come home yet, and I am very anxious about it. No need of that, I trust, I said reassuringly. She will come this morning, no doubt. I don't know. I wish I was sure of that. I don't know what to make of it. I don't understand it. She never did so before. How she could have stayed out and left those two blessed little things all night. And she always seemed such a tender, loving mother, too. I don't understand it. When I returned at dinner-time I found matters still worse. She had not returned. My poor landlady was almost in hysterics, though she tried hard to control herself. To satisfy her I set off to consult the police. My mission was not encouraging. They promised to do their best, but gave slight hopes of a successful result. So, sad, weary, and discouraged, I returned home, only to learn there were no tidings of the missing one. I give her up now, said my weeping landlady. I shall never see her again. She is lost for ever, and those two poor pretty little creatures. By the way, I said, I wanted to speak to you about them. If she never does return, what do you purpose to do with them? Keep them said the generous and impulsive little woman. I wanted to say, if she does not return, I will, if you like, relieve you of one of them. My sister, who lives with me and keeps my house, is a very kind, tender-hearted woman. There are no children in the house, and she would, I am sure, be very kind to the poor little thing. What do you say? No, no, sobbed the poor woman. I cannot part with them. I am a poor woman, it is true, but not too poor to give them a home. And while I have a bit and a sup for myself, they shall have one too. Their poor mother left them here, and if she ever does return, she shall find them here. And if she never returns, then... And she never did return, and no tidings of her fate ever reached us. If she was enticed away by artful blandishments, or kidnapped by cruel violence, we knew not, but I honestly believe the latter. Either way, it was her fatal beauty that led her to destruction, for as I have said before, she was the most perfect creature, the most beautiful Maltese cat that I ever beheld in my life. I am sure she never deserted her two pretty little kittens of her own accord. And if, poor dumb thing, she was stolen and killed for her beautiful fur, still, I say, as I said at first, she was more sinned against than sinning. C. H. Grattan in Titbits End of section 34 End of Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir